Um, okay, this is um, <coughs> uh, not my presentation. I'll do what I do best. I'll present it, take all the credit. Um, um, unfortunately, um, the guys who are going to be talking about this today, um, Gordon Slate of Sora Ascent and Graham Kaylor's uh, company here today. Um, obviously, Graham works for AMC, so I know a bit about the project. Um, I've been involved in the project. Um, I'm just sort of taking an opportunity to talk about um, what we found um, so far. Um, there's not enough time today, we could talk for days about this, but I just want to give you a quick um, idea about the results that we found in. We found uh, digging over the summer. What our initial conclusions are. Um, I know some of the people who visited, some people who took part. Um, my background is also in the museum, so I'll talk about the finds um, and then what we're going to do next. Okay? Um, As has been sort of, I wasn't here yesterday unfortunately, but as has been emphasised already throughout the conference, um, the community projects are not just supposed to be about research. I mean, you heard um, from both speakers this morning that there's great research there, but it's about so much more than that. It's about um, an output, a legacy. Um, it's not just about doing ivory tower academic research. Um, that said, of course, in my view, any good community archaeology project has to be sound on absolutely sound research. Um, they have to go hand in hand. Um, you can have great community projects, but the research has to be really good. So I will be talking about quite a lot of the research because it has um, groundbreaking uh, results so far. So of course, what we're trying to do, of course, um, John Lot Brock is a ticket. I don't know if to rehearse that yet. They're about two thousand years old. I'll come to that. Um, these massive stone towers, typical Alan Brady drawing. Um, big stone towers. When I ever do school stuff, it's like a think of a walnut whip without the walnut on the top. Um, like a cooling tower type idea. Um, and this archetypal picture of a brock where you have uh, potentially animals on uh, the, the floor, if you like, sort of down here, uh, potentially some sort of sleeping area um, or activity area on the first floor. So the idea is you come in the entrance, you go up some stairs, you go and do stuff up here, and then you go to your bed up here. Okay? Um, I'll come back to that. Notice that the hearth's on the first floor, that's a sort of potentially a standard view. Um, it's never really worked for me. I, I could even go to the bed at night with my new log fire burning without panicking about burning the house down. Um, so one of the research questions was to try and understand the architecture, which I'll come back to, and basically understand rocks. Although the rocks have been excavated for hundreds of years, literally, actually very few of them uh, have been dug uh, right down to like this level. Most people run out of money when they get to this, falls down, it gets reused. Um, so I think there's only about five um, brocks that have actually got down to what we call the primary, what we believe to be the primary brock floor level, okay? Um, and as I come to, most archaeologists are obsessed by being, what's the earliest date, what's the date of the stuff, okay? Um, and that was one of the questions we were hoping to tackle. But whilst that, we're trying to get an idea of what actually genuinely went on inside these buildings, okay? But as I say, um, it was far more um, than, than just doing the research. This project, and I deal quite a lot of community archaeology, um, not just myself, but people like Charlotte and the audience who helped at Clactol. And as anybody will know, and I'm sure um, with Graham or other people who have done a community archaeology project, the lady this morning's point was well made. Most people I speak to who do a big community archaeology project and never want to do one again. Um, they're fatigued, they're tired, they get no thanks. Um, these things don't just happen quickly. Okay? Um, Clactol was 15 years in the making. Hopefully I'll show you what a success it was. But it was 15 years in the making. Um, a lot of dedicated people in the local area, uh, people like Gordon Slate, Robin Noble, uh, the Historic Ascent Trust, um, and they had this vision. And what their vision was, um, there was a brook in, the, in, in Solid, one of uh, two in the area. It's about an hour away from Olipool. Um, you really, it's beside Loch Inver. You really sort of are going to Loch Inver because you're not going anywhere else. Um, and they wanted to, to make it into a social um, beneficial project, an educational project, and of course a heritage asset. Um, something in the end, not just a research project. There had to be something tangible for the community um, that would have social uh, and economic and educational purposes. And to me, that was what they were trying to do. They were interested in the research, of course, but the bit of their social and economic drive or heritage asset was really the big drive. Okay? Um, and I think that's true of most community archaeologists' uh, projects. Um, whether it's doing up a museum, getting artifacts back, there has to be something tangible in my view at the end of it that has a legacy um, after people like me have long gone home to Edinburgh. Massive amount of partnership working. Um, they started this with uh, people like uh, Eve who went up and, and uh, surveyed the site when it was then the Royal Commission. Worked closely with uh, Historic Scotland, now Hess of course because it's a scheduled ancient monument. 
worked with uh, the local council, Highland Council, then the Scottish Wildlife Trust, Heritage Lorry Fund, uh, Leader, and then the Landscape Partnership. This is a Landscape Partner project. It's not just it's not just Clack Toll. There's about 20 other projects going on as well. Extensive workshops with the local community. It wasn't just one person's idea. Um, a huge amount of partnership over literally 15 years before they got to where um, the stage was. And, uh, and credit to them, they had a vision, they went for it, um, and uh, I think they were just about to love it. Okay, I'll touch on that at the end. <clears throat> I think quite a lot of people in the audience will probably hear about the results. Um, it has resonated quite um, widely across British um, archaeology. Um, it is an exceptionally important site for reasons I'll hopefully demonstrate. Uh, but do please keep in mind that there's all these other social products that I don't know if I had time to talk about today as well. Three or four years ago, there was some remedial work done on the entrance of the Brock, okay, which I'll come to. And um, there's this thing called a scarcement in the Brock, which is basically the thing, the ledge that holds the timber. Okay, so there's a scarcement here, there'd be a scarcement there probably, but it doesn't survive. Generally, scarcements on Brocks will survive about here. Of course, the wood rots away, it doesn't survive. And all you have is the sort of ledge that would have held or supported the floor. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you imagine this is plateau, and it's not, um, we did some remedial work here under the supervision of um, um, Historic Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland. And while we were doing it, we managed to um, uncover a bit of the scarcement. We found there was burning on it, on the scarcement. And so three or four years ago, that's what the radiocarbon date came back at. So it suggested that there was some burning activity um, on the Scarcemen round about the birth of Christ. Okay? Um, without boring you too much, there's been a long boring debate for how long, or what day Brocks are, were they built when the Romans came, were they built because the Romans were invading. Um, but recent research, places like Scatness, etc., have shown that Brocks are probably well, are uh, pre-Roman. But there is a, one of the big research questions is still, what are the date of these Brocks? Okay? Um, as I say, very few primary broad floor levels have been excavated. Um, there's some debate about whether the dates that apparently show they're early are true, etc. So, again, despite hundreds of years of research, we've still really not got a good idea what the date is of rocks, okay? But this seems to suggest that um, it's probably pre Christ. This was a broad before it started. I'll show you another picture in a minute. This is a laser scan that um, our colleague Graham Kivers does incredibly well. Um, it gives you a sense, of course, uh, for those who have not been, it's actually on the edge of a cliff. It's a sort of sea stack. It's obviously eroded away here. A large part of the, um, a huge part of the project was about consolidation and conserving the monument for the future. I don't have time to touch on that today, but it was a massive stone conservation program that went with this and is still ongoing. And it's very much about having this monument visible, accessible, um, and looked after in the future. Um, and of course, we have bits of it eroding into the sea, um, massive sea cliffs washing away. There was a massive um, issue to do with uh, conservation and preservation. So please keep that in mind today. I don't have time to talk about it, but it wasn't just digging. In fact, a lot of the digging was to do with the conservation of the actual monument. So, obviously, I've noted here this is the entrance. These are obviously the monumental rock walls that have stairs in them, and it was just literally fell down and was full of rubble. The working hypothesis that we had from a research point of view before we started was um, we thought it collapsed more or less after it was built. So we were hoping, unlike most rocks, that if we removed all that rubble, we'd come down to a, what we would more or less term more or less the first or the last occupation before the rubble fell down. And because the radiocarbon date suggested it was pre Christ, we were assuming that there wouldn't be any Pictish Viking stuff. It was built, it went on fire, it fell down. Okay? So um, the guys spent a month removing 282 tonnes of rubble by hand. They didn't just chuck it over the sea. They, had to, they built paths to help access. Um, they used the stone to do reconstructions of um, uh, prehistoric architecture and the like. And they landscaped the land around it. They didn't just throw away. But uh, we had local communities, local, local community digs supervised by AOC. And the guy spent four month, uh, month moving nothing but rubble. Okay. That's also an aerial shot of it there. Um, during the rubble being removed, the rubble was up here when they started. You can get a sense of the, of the, of the land now. Lock Inver is over here. Clack Toll, um, 
camp sites here. It's got a good visitor attraction. Um, had lots and lots of visitors which have come to it. And this is more or less it um, as the sort of first stage of the rubble was being removed. And you can, we're talking about removing rubble this size. We're not, it's not pebbles in the pocket type thing. This is what it started, uh, looked like when, so this is the scarcity here, where we found the date of the burning. This is the, the entrance here, keep your eye on that little tool there. Um, that's what they ended up doing. Okay, so massive amount of rubble removal, and then once you removed the rubble, you came down to these layers here. So from that, to that. We also removed some rubble from the outside as part of the consolidation program. Um, uncovered the stairs, that's also the bit that's fallen into the sea, we've consolidated all that. Um, showing, exposing the outside of the brock now, redoing some of the stairs. Um, floor level here, it's actually built on bedrock. Anybody who's uh, been to places like Dunkarloway and uh, Dintrodden, this idea of all brock floor levels are, are flat is not true. Sometimes they're built on bedrock, goes up and down, um, it's the same as clap toe. So you'd actually have um, Coming the entrance here, then I don't know what they did here. It might have been another minute of used this, but it was bedrock. It was bedrock rising up. Okay. Again, we worked very closely with a stone mason who's on site every day, proper uh, conservation architect, and historic Scotland's conservation architect, as well as the Shelter Monument people, um, who helped us design the strategy um, and made sure we were doing it right and things like that. Okay. Then it came down to. What we're thinking at the moment is more or less um, an occupation level um, that more or less dates to just after the rock was built and then fell down. So we're thinking at the moment that everything we find in here is probably um, that first century BC potentially early. So it's not quite a Pompeii effect, but you need to sort of think about it like that. That's how we're sort of viewing it at the moment. Um, Eve went to visit the site, did an amazingly uh, powerful Facebook entry uh, when she got back and she related it to imagine watching Strictly come dancing and then your dad comes through and goes I seem to be burning the house down and you all run out. So if that's the case we should be finding the television, the wees, that kind of stuff. Not the wee for the medieval but the, the modern. Um, so we're hoping that maybe this is an occupational level where people have just literally abandoned it very quickly and then it fell down. Just to give you a quick idea of what we found in terms of architecture, um, souterrains are underground storage things. We, we think we found one of these um, potentially to do with the, the roughly primary occupation of the site. Um, so within the brock, you'd walk down, uh, there'd be some, this would be floored or something, and you'd have perhaps a grain store and, and, and the like underneath it. That's a pretty substantial central hearth. Okay, so there's no cattle over here, we don't think. And the ground floor, that is a hearth, that's a partition. This is literally just a big hearth with a massive floor level around it. And if you keep your eye on this, it's called a knocking stone, I'll come back to this. And this is where the suturin was, this would have presumably been um, floored with a wooden floor. As with many of these sites, we think that although we're calling it primary occupation, it's probably phasing within that. There are three hearths, um, so it's not just one hearth. So there's another hearth underneath it. And that's the primary hearth. Now the great thing of course about that is if you've got three hearths, that's what is very good for archaeologists. There should be stuff to date in that, you get a dating sequence. Um, is it, we don't think it's hundreds of years, it's probably generational, probably even that. Um, we're doing Bayesian statistics, all that kind of stuff. So you've got these three hearths, top one, middle one, bottom one. So you get a nice sequence of radiocarbon dates and plant microfossils and artifacts studies through that as well. Um, obviously it's got associated floor levels with that. Um, the guys sectioned it to bits, QB editing to bits. Uh, a lot of post-excavation will be soil micromorphology, that kind of stuff, radiocarbon dating, basic statistics. And of course we did find really good preservation, um, really, really good bone uh, preservation. Um, then we found bits of, um, obviously lots of organic material. And of course burning. It's still unclear, I mean, when I say, we don't really know if it's burnt down like a catastrophic thing or whether it went on fire, they dampened it out or it fell down, but we do think there was some burning episode that caused the abandonment of this thing um, and then presumably um, the collapse of this um, as well. So we have potentially, um, it's also not just stone partitions inside, there's wooden partitions as well. We think we've potentially got parts of that as well. 
um, the actual timbers that would have been part of the actual superstructure. Everything's blocks of stone, but of course there'd be a massive timber uh, component to them. I mean, you the whole thing. Um, a big thing in Iron Age studies or in archaeology over the last 10 years is trying to understand different areas of uh, roundhouse use. But of course, you need to have a nice occupation layer to do that. Um, we did, so we did that. We took samples in every single one of these squares. The volunteer numbers dropped. No. Um, but it's that type of idea where we should be able to say, well, perhaps they did textile working over in that corner, perhaps they did grain processing in that corner, that type of idea. So we didn't want to miss the opportunity to do that. And the best example of why we think this thing burned down was, um, and they literally, as you've suggested, ran away, was this, is this thing called a knocking stone. I've got um, an ethnographic picture of it in a minute. But basically, this is the thing you do when you get your, um, your grain and you pound it up in that knocking stone, um, and then you process it. But that's how you'd, um, you'd then turn that into your rolling corn to make bread and the like. Okay? So it's such a, a, an important commodity that there's, not, there's no chance that you'd burn it deliberately. And there's no chance you still leave it in the rotten stone. That was a bit like starting to make a pizza and then burning your dough. And you can see it's absolutely packed full of grain. So we have sectioned it. It's probably one of the, I guess, one of the largest, best preserved dated environmental samples from a rock, I would imagine. You can see the rotten stone. It's basically like a big pounder. That's an idea what to do. So you're, you're basically smashing up um, all your cereal before you, you further process it. So we think because of that evidence and the evidence for other burning that they literally would have abandoned this place probably quite quickly. Didn't have time to stop and take stuff. They just ran away. Again, I don't have time to go into this. Um, good friend and colleague of ours, John Barber, he was on site not to dig the inside but to dig the walls, help with the consolidation. He's done a PhD on Brock architecture. Um, he's doing the Ring Lectures next year, go along and see that, it'll utterly revolutionise the way you think about architecture. Um, and his big um, thing is, if you're going to understand the Brock walls, you have to destroy them. Not destroy them, dig them very carefully. Um, lots and lots of Brocks are excavated, very few people actually dig the, the walls. Lots of castles are excavated, very few people dig the walls. That sort of idea. If you really want to understand how a structure is built, you're going to have to get into the structure. What he's finding is that he probably thinks, and I don't have time to go into it, that there was probably a brock there that was built and it collapsed almost before nobody used it. And then this brock was built and then that fell down. Which sort of makes the story a bit complicated because it's not really the primary use of a primary brock because it's probably the secondary brock. That makes sense? Yeah? Go on to John's right the lectures next year as he'll explain it far better than me. But there's lots of different... This idea that brocks are just monolithic monuments built in one go without being modified is just not true. And we found that on other sites as well. Obviously the date of construction, um, we've got the date from the Scarcement, just before Christ, uh, around about that time. We do have samples that we're confident, they're sealed, we can date from underneath the brock in different areas, so that should hopefully be able to give us um, some sort of uh, sequence of perhaps um, dates from underneath the brock, during the brock, that kind of stuff. So we should be able with Bayesian statistics hopefully to get a very tight date of the, the construction and the use of the site. The big thing for archaeology though, I think, is actually we should have a snapshot of um, domestic activity probably in between the 3rd, 2nd century BC. Okay, and this for me is the big, big thing and this is what we're working on at the moment. Roland, um, this is Roland's hand, I think, one of these, Roland was on site, he found these lamps. Graham kept me up to date with the finds uh, when I was away and it got boring after a while because he kept on saying I found another stone lamp. Generally, if you're digging on these sites, finding one stone lamp is amazing. Finding 15 of them is quite exceptional. Um, lots and lots and lots of stone lamps, presumably used for um, lights, candles, drinking. Just I'll show you a few examples. Different sizes, different decoration, different ornament. Lots and lots and lots of spindle worlds. Probably unsurprisingly, obviously spindle worlds are used for, for weaving, for textile working. They obviously have to wear clothes. Not entirely unsurprising, but the sheer volume we had, the place they were found in the brock, etc. You can start talking about people sitting in corners, um, doing different textile working. Why were some decorated? Why were, they, why were others uh, not? Different sizes for weight, that kind of stuff. And also, I hope you can see, there's a wee 
trying to be trying to make a wee hole in there. They're presumably actually, of course, making their own spindle whorls on site as well. Lots of bone, animal bone, but we do have bone artifacts. Um, we've got a, a bone moustache comb, bone pins, uh, weaving combs, so another stage of textile working. Another implement, perhaps a scoop, something like that. So there's lots and lots of bone artifacts um, that have probably survived in our Brock sites, but not in that same sort of context. So we can get another sense of what people were doing at the same time. Strike lights, the equivalent of your match. That's how you look your fire. Potentially that could be the bad object that set the whole thing alight. And lots and lots and lots and lots of rotary quivers. Um, again, domestic activity, not entirely surprising. Certainly you find it on lots of Brock sites. But this is the first proper opportunity to understand them in the context that they were found. And of course, lots of animal bones, what kind of uh, animal bones are they using, and things like that. Now, the big thing for me is it's called the Iron Age. If you go into museum stores, go around uh, looking at archaeological excavations, particularly in Atlantic Scotland, Orkney, Sutherland, the Western Isles, you can count the number of iron objects in a secure context in about one hand. Okay, everybody thinks that's preservation, it's probably true. Other people think ah, they didn't really have very much iron, it was all controlled by the Romans or whatever. Um, Graham and the team found four reaping hooks, so it's about like your sickle, um, the Iron Age version. Um, it's also corroded, we'll need to clean it up, but that's basically if you think of um, Graham's sickle, same sort of idea, made of iron, and it's got the wooden handle attached to it. We found four of these in the same corner, chances are they're hanging up, they just fell. Um, Iron axes, very, very rare. I think there's only about a handful of these across the whole of Scotland. Um, that's the axe, it's corroded, that's where your handle would have gone. Uh, pins that need conserved, iron pins. So there's a, quite a significant iron and bronze component kicking around in the pre Christ era, the pre Roman era, which I think will be really important uh, to Iron Age studies when we start studying all this stuff. Um, typical bronze pins, this fits in well with the date. Typical uh, early bronze age pin, that's uh, a bronze iron age pin. And the pottery is really important. Nobody really understands the pottery sequence in Solund. Is it related to the Western Elf sequence? Is it related to Orkney? Part of the Brock debate is was the Brock in, invented in the Western Elves and then people in Orkney copied it or vice versa and all that kind of stuff. The pottery is quite important to this because quite a lot of pottery in Orkney is plain, quite a lot of it in Cave Ness is plain. Most of it in the Western Isles is um, decorated with impressed ware, uh, wrote, uh, cordoned ware, that kind of stuff. They were using the pins to make the decoration. And a lot of pottery we've got is very, very similar to the Western Isles type of pottery. Uh, cordoned ware, um, also impressed ware, and that kind of stuff. So this is typical Orkney cave nest stuff, uh, like a soggy digestive biscuit, hardly any decoration on it. This is your, your very similar stuff from places like Neep, um, <coughs> the Solace Wheelhouse, Beery Wheelhouse in the Western Isles, and the pottery appears to be at the moment far more aligned to the Western Isles than it does to Orkney. Perhaps that's telling us about some sort of connections or cultural significance. We've literally just come off site a couple of weeks ago, and people like Charlotte and Graham were there the whole summer um, with a massive community involvement. People like um, Roland from Osas were there, and the questions we're doing now over the next year, um, a bit like with Graham. Graham did, we have to obviously publish this, there'll be a publication on this within about 18 months. The post excavation can't wait for 10 years, uh, we're doing it now, and the questions we're going to be asking and we'll be refining over the next 18 months will be, who lived at Clacto? What was the status and the links through the artefacts? Um, obviously people are, will be interested in the Iron Age chronology, we'll be throwing lots of Bayesian statistics at that. Um, and of course that wonderful opportunity we think of having a, a sealed occupation layer um, probably with not that much reuse in it that we could begin to do um, what kind of different pottery we're using it. And I think this idea that I've always thought that, that pottery goes seamlessly from one type to the other across chronology is just going to be blown out of the water. A bit like the beaker studies where when you actually date these things you find that they're using different types of pottery at the same time. Um, I think you'd have to be hard pushed to argue that there's lots of different chronologies within the occupation layers of Clacto, so the dates will be the dates and the pottery within that will be the pottery. Um, and I think that will turn the, quite a lot of our ways of thinking about chronology on its head. So what we'll do now is spines analysis, soil sample analysis, bone analysis, all the usual stuff. Um, 
very exciting from an archaeological point of view, but I hope you'll agree. Um, that's what we'll be doing um, at the moment. And I generally think it will revolutionise not just Ascent or Scottish armies, but I think the British armies. These things are, are very, very real. Just to finish, um, I could talk to give a separate lecture about the fantastic participation and outreach. Please don't go away thinking this is just a research project. It's, it's not, but I know quite a lot of people probably would want to hear about the research. 55 volunteers. Um, it's a big site, but quite hard to get people inside it, as God, uh, people like Gordon and Roland will tell you. About 55 volunteers did, did, did come. That, we couldn't have done that without them. Archaeology, you'll see where there is that horrible term, professional supervisors. Most of the volunteers we worked with have probably got more experience than we had. Fantastic people like NOSAS, Historic Ascent, um, and we couldn't have done it without them. And they, they didn't just turn up when the rubble had been removed. They were there for the months in the rain, etc., etc. 1,300 visitors to site. The population of Assen is 600. People like Eve, people from uh, Edinburgh got in a car to visit the site. It was probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to see something like this. There's a campsite nearby, it was inundated, people were coming to it. Um, and Charlotte, um, as well as being a great archaeologist, does fantastic so, uh, school community stuff. There's 150 school people who attended the site, we're doing other outreach work as well. And as I say, it's not, okay, what happens now, okay? Part of the reason I sort of set this up by asking Alex the question. Um, the site obviously now needs to be maintained. There's a lot of stone conservation work went into this. Lots of complicated discussions about how do we show the public what we've put in, what we've removed, that kind of stuff. Historic Asset are obviously committed to maintaining this in the future, so there's conservation management plans, maintenance of the monument. There'll be continual educational things. For those who've been to Historic Asset, it's a massive artistic community. So they're going to use um, the Brock, uh, not just as um, a research opportunity, but stimulus for different art projects. And of course it will, and it already has, become a heritage asset. Okay, so it's, on, it's not quite on the NC500. NC500, you don't know what the NC500 is? Your points are made. The, the best thing was NC500 is basically a marketing tool from Inverness that goes around to Johnny Groats, then goes along Sutherland and comes back to Inverness. And all it's really doing is publicising all the existing things that are there. Um, it was done by the North Highland Initiative. It's a fantastic idea and it's completely revolutionised um, tourism um, in that area. Um, whereas before you could get a bed and breakfast in Wick quite easily, you can't get one for a lot of money now and it's certainly going to cost you four times as much. So it's been a huge investment. This will be presumably part of it. So this idea of having an asset at the end of it and not just having a great community project and a good research project, having something tangible for the community at the end of it um, will definitely, uh, definitely happen. And to me, probably just to get a bit of discussion going, um, I think this is a, and I'm not just saying it's because we were involved in it, and it's been our privilege to be involved in it, but we were more or less the technicians, the advisors. I think this is a perfect example of how you should be doing archaeology in the future. Massive partnership projects driven by local communities, people on the ground who've got a passion and a massive stakeholder in it. Working with, to use the horrible term, the, the big top people, it's a scheduled monument, you have to get their advice. Um, of course you do, they're the experts on things like scheduled monuments, uh, conservation and the like. And just getting really dedicated people on the ground who have serious, serious commitment to longer term education of social um, and economic things. I think this is the way that archaeology should be done. Um, it's been done. I thought the lady's presentation this morning was brilliant. That's exactly what should happen. There are hundreds of local community groups out there who could tell me and other people far more about their heritage and how to do it properly um, um, than the top, often the top people um, can do. And I think that partnership working is absolutely critical um, in the future. So if you get, take away anything from this rant, take the last bit. I think this is a good, a good example of how archaeology should be done in the future, um, and it clearly works. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication. It's a lot of budget. You need to have financial understanding, cash flow, um, legacy, insurance, that kind of stuff. Okay. If you want to uh, continue following progress, we've got designated to our Facebook um, accounts. We'll be putting things up about post excavation. Um, we're doing quite a lot of post excavation as much as we can in the area. The West Seven is not just about. Uh, we're going to be. It's not just about teaching people training. How to dig, it's about how to do post excavation as well. Um, and of course, we tell us thanks to um, all the funders, which again goes back to my point about partnerships. Historic Environment Scotland were a huge lead in this, not just in terms of funding, but also um, advice. 
constant advice during the setup, conservation management planning, um, on-site work, post-excavation. Um, me, to me, this is if they want to have an example of SCARF or their archaeology strategy project, I think that's as good as it's going to get. Um, there are of course lots of local funding, SSE, Pilgrim Trust, Landfill, National Lorry, all that pain in the background and trying to raise the money to make it, to make it happen, that kind of stuff, okay? Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.